Have you ever wondered how your sales performance compares against your competitors and peers? The B2B Sales Benchmark Report provides the definitive guide to what success looks like in 2021. See how you compare in terms of win rate, sales cycle, average deal value, relationships, and engagement. You can see the results and get the full report at ebster.com forward slash B2B dash sales dash benchmarks. This is Sales Ops Demystified, the number one most downloaded podcast in sales operations. We invite the brightest minds in sales ops onto the show to deconstruct the what, why, and how behind rep productivity, forecasting, metrics, and all things revenue. This podcast is brought to you by EBSA, a revenue intelligence platform used to identify risk in the pipeline and score customer engagement, and is sponsored by the Global Sales Operations Association and the UK Revenue Operations Network. Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we have a legend in the game, in our myth, Monty. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you, man? So Monty is extremely experienced in sales. Currently a senior revenue operations manager at Lob.com, but also has a content creation uh, passion or project for in the sales space at the same time. So I know we're going to, there's going to be much to jump into. But first question, Monty, I want to go right back, even pre-sales, if there was such a time. And to understand what you were doing, and then also why you then came into sales. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, when I got out of the army, I I needed a job, and um, uh, through uh, some strange circumstances, I found myself uh, as a freshly minted network engineer working for a consulting company. I had absolutely no experience. I got the job because I. Bought a book from the bookstore on Netware. Uh, I think it was 2.0. And over a weekend, read half of the book, went in and did a practical server build to get the job. The guy hired me on the spot, dropped me into a customer, and I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> and my charade was uh, found out after a few days, and uh, it was too late. They didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the customer. So he sent another more experienced consultant in with me, and I learned how to do networking. Um, fast forward about five years, a couple of companies later, um, I got approached by one of our customers or one of my vendors actually. And they said, Hey, you'd make a really good systems engineer. Um, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know what that is. Tell me, tell me more. And they're like, well, you, you know, help the sales guys, uh, implement our technology and you know, you can make this much money and you get a little commission. And I'm like, sounds great. So I went down that path. And then very quickly, I learned that, Sales engineers actually do all the selling. <laughs> they do all the selling and they get none of the glory or commission. So I, I complained about that one day in front of my VP of sales. And he basically told me, he's like, hey, man, why don't you just like take the leap and go into sales if you don't like the way you're comped? So I did. And that was 26 years ago now, 25 years ago. And I never looked back. And since then, I've... Um, developed a real affinity for startups. This is my seventh startup. Um, Been acquired a handful of times, had one kind of terrible exit, uh, one kind of break-even exit. Um, And, you know, I've managed sales teams as large as 50 people. Um, I've worked for Fortune 500s. Um, I've built sales teams from scratch. I've consulted with companies on how to go from, you know, being a... uh, tiny little company to a much larger company. Um, And I just love selling. I love the thrill of the chase. I love engaging with customers and driving solutions. Uh, And at this stage of my career where I'm kind of on the back nine, 
I'm really excited about mentoring and coaching and kind of raising up that next generation of sales professionals because it's a great and noble career. And uh, if you do it well with high integrity, uh, it can be extremely rewarding. There's so many things I want to pick up on in that stretch of audio there, but I want to go back to the, the sale, time as a sales engineer. The, so I, I can imagine in the sales process with a technical project, which uh, product, which is obviously the case when you have a sales engineer. Uh, in that process, is the salesperson almost, you're saying the salesperson is almost redundant because they can't get into the technical detail and therefore the engineer leads almost and is therefore doing more of the selling. Is, is that how that was working when you were a sales engineer? Yeah, I mean, what I quickly found was that um, to really connect value to the customer's pain point, many times, especially when you're dealing with software, you have to demonstrate it. They have to play with it. They have to touch it. They have to see it in action because otherwise it's just stuff on a slide, you know, or in a PowerPoint. Um, and that's the sales engineer's job is to, you know, install the software, get it up and running and start delivering value, usually in a pilot or a POC for the customer. But in that process and in the conversations and in the inter interactions with um, the customer, you tend to dig out a lot more pain points. So the sales engineer is in a really critical place in the sales cycle. And, you know, if I'm being honest, even as a 20 plus year experienced uh, sales executive and sales leader, um, those engineering resources are the ones that move the needle the most on the deal at the end of the day. And um, many times and in many companies still to this day, we don't compensate them appropriately for the work that they actually do. I think someone, and maybe this exists already, but someone should create a podcast for sales engineers because I, I, I think they're an underserved and underappreciated job role. You're right, Monty. Uh, I completely agree. And in fact, it, today, in fact, I had the, uh, the great pleasure of hiring our first sales engineer at Lob uh, last year. He's been on board for just a little over a year now. And uh, when I encountered him, he was a 15 year tenured sales engineer, which I've frankly never met one before because they almost always end up getting bled off into the sales ranks um, pretty quickly within, you know, if you find a sales engineer that's got 10 years experience, that's a rarity. 15 years, I, I'd never seen it before. And, but this guy is literally got the DNA of a sales engineer. Nothing excites him more than helping customers connect the dots and drive value and he doesn't ever want to carry a bag, doesn't really care about earning commission. He just loves the kudos and the props and seeing the deals come to fruition. And more importantly, seeing the customers actually derive value from the solution long term. That's his jam. And I, I, it's incredible. I wish I could clone him 500 times. <laughs> he sounds amazing. What's his, what's his name? We can give his name shot. is Mike Tuffley. And he is a, just an absolutely stellar member of our team. The things that he has done, especially for some of our strategic accounts, like uh, Verizon and Capital One, I mean, just astonishing. Uh, literally, those deals would not have happened without him, period. Shout Close. out. Shout out to Mike. Now, next, I want to move on to, the, because it's somewhere along the sales story you shared, there was a transition into Oz. When yeah. did that happen and why did that happen? So it's happened a number of times. It, it primarily occurred when I, um, uh, it was, I can't even count how many startups ago. Anyway, it was a startup in the early 2000s where I got exposed. I was working for a company that did sales methodology um, solutions. Um, used to be the TAS group, then it became Altify. Anyway, um, they they had, a, we were growing quickly and we were all just kind of pulling you know, extra duty to try to figure some of this stuff out. And that was really my first uh, engagement with implementing Salesforce, designing a sales process, designing a compensation plan, and kind of putting all the pieces together to make a sales program run. Um, a few years after that, I started a consulting firm when I was kind of in between gigs, which is what, you know, people like us do. And uh, I had an opportunity to work with a bunch of clients over the next uh, five, seven years. Um, and 
men, much of the work was that is, hey, we're getting ready to scale. We need to have a rock solid sales process, good comp plan, get the right tools in, make sure everybody's trained, make sure we have the right reporting and metrics. So I kind of learned it by doing it. Um, and then over the last four or five years, um, I've had an opportunity in le- leadership positions to, you know, guide the people who run those functions. And then when I got to lob here, um, you know, my job, I'm on my third gig basically here at, at lob. Um, they've, I think they've figured out how to use me. Finally, I'm kind of like the fixer. Um, so when they, when they have a challenging process or, or problem, they'll, they'll come to me and say, Hey, you know, can you lay some wood on this thing and <laughs> get it done. Um, so n- sales operations seem to be the right place for me. Um, and my job spans both operations and enablement uh, today. Got it. You also mentioned that sales can be an incredibly rewarding uh, vocation, yeah. but isn't necessarily... Well, oh yeah, and and I totally agree. I, I think sales people are great. I love sales. I, I think it is changing slightly now. But why historically has sales not been seen as the noble profession that it is? Well, I think um, the, for the average Joe or Jane out there, we have only a handful of touch points with professional salespeople. When you buy your house, when you buy a car, um, when you buy a jacuzzi or some furniture, you know, and unfortunately, the people that sell in those arenas are not the most skilled. They're not the best trained. And um, because of the way they're compensated, many of them work on commission only. Um, they're just hungry and it shows. So it doesn't yield a really great user experience or customer experience. You know, when you're talking about B2B selling, um, it's a fundamentally different proposition. B2B selling is, it's not about selling. It's about helping companies solve problems. And in my case, or in our case, with technology. Um, that's a very different calling. Uh, you have to be an intellectually curious person. You have to be kind of smart. You have to be highly organized, self-motivated, driven, lifelong learner, uh, you have to really kind of like talking to people. You have to be a good storyteller. Um, there's so many characteristics and traits and things you need to learn and continue to sharpen as you go through your career that, you know, like the legal profession, like the medical profession, like professional educators, it's something where once you get on that track, you're, you're, you're never getting to the destination, you're always improving and growing along the way if you're doing it well. Got it. I totally agree. I think that it, sales almost should be like the, the lawyer or the doctor where you go in when you're like 25 and then you stay and you do it for 40 years and then you retire. I, I think, you think about it, it's curious because, I mean, those other professions that I mentioned, those have very uh, rigid educational requirements. They have rigid certification, professional certification requirements or licensing requirements. You know, you can't just call yourself a lawyer, right? You have to go to specialized education and get a license to practice. Sales, though, we will literally take just about anybody, throw them, uh, you know, uh, some collateral and a, and a Rolodex and say, have at it. I mean, still to this day, so many companies, really good companies that do well, that's kind of their approach. Like, hey, you seem like a good egg. Let's give you a shot. If you don't work out, we got 40 other people that'll sit in that chair and do the same thing. That's crazy town. <laughs> you know, why we don't have a master's degree program in, in selling is um, a mystery to me, honestly. Maybe we should maybe we should start it, Monty. <laughs> Looking into Q four of this year and the start of next year, what would you say a sales ops manager should be looking should be looking into? I know it's a very broad question. Yeah. So, you know, in, in my podcast world, uh, in my web series, I've been talking to an awful lot of sales leaders 
CEOs, VCs, founders. Um, and I think everybody's struggling with the same thing right now. And for sales operations, they need to be um, completely in tune with what the struggles of the organization are and what's keeping the leaders awake at night. And, you know, right now, in the middle of this pandemic, we're what, month seven now, month eight? This, when this happened, everybody was like, this is a th three to six week problem. Then all of a sudden it was, oh, crap, there goes the quarter. Then it was like, whoa, wait a minute, this might actually be our reality for the rest of the year. Well, here we are in Q4 and we're all doing our planning for next year. And I think everybody is on the same page that boo, the world is not going to go back to normal next year. Next year is going to look a lot like this year. Maybe we'll be on a little bit of an incline, kind of pulling ourselves out of the water. But I don't think a lot is going to change. So for sales operations, we need to be crystal clear on what the, what the activity yielded this year. So our measures and our metrics have to be rock solid and 100% accurate because we can't take a mulligan next year. Most of us took a big mulligan this year. Um, next year is kind of make a break for a lot of companies that were that were depressed or behind the eight ball this year. So we have to have clear numbers on what we did this year, and we have to have reasonable, sensible, and realistic planning going into next year. If you're a company that was down 25% this year, and you're thinking you're going to grow 75 or 100% next year, and you don't have a radically different plan to make that happen, you're insane. <laughs> and you probably shouldn't be in your job. Uh, and a sales operations person who who is being asked to create the tools and the metrics to to you know do that should push back hard and say, oh, guys, I don't think we're going to get there because here's the data. If there's ever been a moment in which we need to be 100% data driven, it's right now. It's right now because the data doesn't lie; it just doesn't. If you have a weak pipeline going into Q1, you're going to have a shitty Q1. I'm sorry to tell you that's just the way it is. And if you haven't done something to adjust your demand generation to fill your pipeline for Q2 yet, then drop everything you're doing and get busy with that right now today. Um, I had this conversation with our sales team you know, this last couple of weeks. I'm like, Q4, we, we as a company have been extremely blessed through this pandemic. Um, we've grown, we've uh, exceeded our goals, we've hired more people. Um, it is not the typical story that we've been hearing. But we're still pragmatic enough to know that that could all be out the window going into next year. Um, so we need to plan accordingly. So I told our sales teams, I said, guys, where you normally have a two and a half X um, multiplier for your pipeline, you need a three or a four X going into the first half of next year. And let's get busy doing that right now. It's, it almost sounds like that's part of the sales leadership role. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is that not the VP of sales who's going in and doing that? Or are you essentially acting as that? Person? No, but we, we have a very uh, collegial mindset and a very team focused mindset at Lob. So, you know, we have um, a sales team and a CS team of about a dozen people. But we've got a CRO, we've got a director of sales, and we've got me kind of the sales coach operations guy and we all throw ourselves into the ring with the team and try to all be going in the same direction uh, more is better in that regard for sure makes sense now let's talk about the content creation side why did you and i think i have the answer to this already but why did you step step up and start producing i think it's a podcast and a uh, and or web series on the topic of sales well, one, I found myself with a lot of extra time <laughs> during this pandemic, just being at home. You know, I, I was working in San Francisco um, and living between two cities, and now I'm back here in Chicago at home. And so I just have a lot of extra time, especially because I'm two hours out of phase with the rest of my company. So I wanted to fill that time doing something productive. And um, I'm a big consumer of podcasts uh, and, and video web series. I, I just love getting the input and, and seeing what other people are thinking about and working on. 
So I, you know, and I sat down and I was like, man, if I was going to do a podcast, what would I do it about? And I started looking at all the people that I know in my first level network. And I'm like, man, I got a lot of really good people who've got a lot of great experience. Let me reach out to some of these folks. And I was blown away by the response. Everybody was like, yeah, let's do this. Come on. And I'm like, okay, let's do this. So, you know, I'm still trying to figure out kind of what my lane is, but I think I'm trying to be a little bit more general than super specific. I, I like talking to a lot of different people. I like talking to VCs. I like talking to CEOs. I like talking to revenue leaders. And coming soon, I'm going to be talking to some high-performing individual contributors too. Um, and I like to talk about you know people who are early career, mid-career, late career, people who are running big companies, little companies, startups, lifestyle companies, because I think... The moment we're in right now, nobody has the right playbook. Everybody is struggling for what to do next. And I think by putting our heads together as a marketplace, we're going to probably save a lot of time, um, keep companies from making a lot of really dumb mistakes, and hopefully get to a place where the majority of companies are doing well. Not great, but well (laughs) in surviving. You know what I mean? Makes sense. Final question. Who in the world of sales slash revenue ops would you love to take for lunch? Oh, man. You know, honestly, I, I think if, if I could sit down for lunch with somebody uh, I would want to sit down with Satya Nadella, <clears throat> CEO of Microsoft. What he and his team have done with Microsoft over the last five years is just astonishing. I mean, they went from a stodgy, much maligned behemoth to a nimble, active, innovative just vanguard of the industry. It's it's really a remarkable turnaround for a company that wasn't doing poorly, but to just re-spin that whole company into what it is today, it's just remarkable. Uh, wonderful, wonderful company. And then if, on the other side, if I had to talk to somebody else, I'm trying really hard to get Simon Sinek on my show <laughs> because Simon just, everything he says is just solid gold. So. Not strictly RevOps, but I'm going to take them anyway because they're relevant. Yeah, yeah. well, Monty. because you know what? They all, they all, everything that they talk about feeds into the world of RevOps. It just does because we're the ones that have to operationalize the visions, the plans, the whatever, you know? Exactly. Where can people find you and the podcast? Yeah, so the easiest way to find me is just go to YouTube and type in the sales coach. That's my kind of handle. With the dollar, uh, also, with, with the dollar sign, right? Um, with the actually, not with the dollar sign if you're, if you're just looking for me. Um, uh, and then if you want to find me on LinkedIn, just look up Monty Fowler, M-O-N-T-Y-F-O-W-L-E-R. Um, I'm super open to connecting with just about anybody um, and uh, would love to help in any way that I can. Monty, it's been a it's been a super interesting, much broader discussion than we typically have on this show. But I think it's good to give the, the audience is primarily sales ops, but I think it's good to give the context to like to, it's good to cover these topics because it's going to broaden the understanding or experience of sales ops for the audience. So I want to thank you for coming on and and giving us this kind of odyssey of sales knowledge and experience. Absolutely. My pleasure, Tom. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. If you are listening on a podcast listening application, then please subscribe, rate, and review. And if you have any questions about the show, if you know a guest, or if you have any questions about sales operations, just hit me up at tomhunt at ebster.com. That's tomhunt at ebster.com.